I am John Lewis by Brad Meltzer, illustrated by Christopher Eliopoulos. I am John Lewis from Ordinary People Change the World by Brad Meltzer, illustrated by Christopher Eliopoulos. I am John Lewis. What should you do when you see something that's unfair? Should you ignore it? Should you walk away? Or should you march forward and try to make things better? Even as a little boy, I liked making things better. On our farm in Alabama, we'd fill a bucket with rain to water our vegetables and flowers. I loved making things grow, raising things up. There you go. On our farm, we raised cotton, peanuts, corn, and my favorite, chickens. No one else could tell the chickens apart, but I could. We had Rhode Island Reds, Bantams, and Dominiques. They each had their own personality, and though my family thought it was strange, I even named a few. Come on, Lil Pullet. Lil Pullet was my favorite. She followed me everywhere, like a pet. Big Bell once fell down a well. We couldn't get her out for five days. Until we lowered down a basket with breadcrumbs. Darned if she didn't climb right in. Chick, chick, chickies! My parents told me to feed them, but I'd always just talk to them first. When I was four years old, an uncle gave me a Bible. By five, I could read it myself. At night, I'd pretend the chickens were my congregation. I was their preacher. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. They'd squawk at first, then settle down and get very still. To me, they seemed so vulnerable. I gave them love, and they loved me back. That love and compassion is something I carried into the world. Yet life wasn't easy. When I was growing up, black people were treated very unfairly just because of the color of our skin. If you were black, you couldn't sit next to a white person on a bus, use the same water fountain, or eat in the same restaurant. We can't sit inside with the white people? Just enjoy your drink. Stay out of trouble. Even as a kid, I knew it wasn't fair. Here's the white school with the new playground. Here's my school with no playground. When I was a teen, the laws changed so that black and white people wouldn't have different schools or be treated unequally. I was so excited. I bet they're going to fix our school. But for us, nothing changed. Leave it be. Stay out of trouble. My parents didn't want me making waves. My grandmother had a different approach. Back then, if you were black and a white person came walking down the street, you were expected to cross to the other side. You better move to the other side. Thank you, but I'm fine where I am. My grandmother knew the rule was unfair, so she respectfully refused to accept it. You have a good day now. At 11 years old, I went to Buffalo, New York with my uncle. There, I was impressed that black and white people worked together and even lived next door to each other. When I got back home, I realized that everyone didn't have the same chance at the American dream. Thankfully, there were other ways for me to see what the world had to offer. At my school library, I found magazines and newspapers with black leaders who inspired me. My dear children, read, read everything. Librarian Corrine Harvey At 15, my life changed when I learned about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. They inspired me to get into trouble, good trouble necessary trouble, which means standing up against unfair treatment. Soon enough, I did just that. Since our own town library was for whites only, I went inside and politely said, I'd like to apply for a library card, please. When they refused, I circulated a petition around school. We never got a response, but that petition was a start, an action, and now I wanted to do more. During college, I finally got to meet my hero, Dr. King. 
I also met Jim Lawson, who would turn my world around. He taught a workshop on nonviolence using methods developed by Gandhi. It's called Civil Disobedience. It's how you change an evil system without violence. We must use passive resistance. What's that? Love. We'll use love and peaceful ways to change what's unfair in society. Right there, I knew that this is what I was meant for. Every Tuesday night in church, we practiced our nonviolent strategies. If someone screamed at you, you looked straight ahead and never dreamed of hitting or screaming back. Sometimes it's hard to keep calm. To do it, I try to remember that all people have the capacity for good. When you show your enemy love, it makes you a better human being. Our first trial run was a department store. My whole life, I, could, I was told I couldn't use the library or drink at the fountain or eat in a restaurant. I hated those rules, but I always followed them. Until now. It's store policy not to serve colored people here. I was nervous, but I didn't let it stop me. Peacefully, calmly, I sat down. Eventually, we left without an incident. A week later... We repeated it. Word began to spread. Soon, four students started a new sit-in in the Greensboro, North Carolina. That grew to ten students, then 85. In Nashville, our protest grew bigger as well. What started as a small sit-in was becoming a movement. Ma'am, may we be served? We don't serve your kind here. It wasn't easy. Sometimes people attacked us. On this day, we were sent to jail. We told you, you can't be in those seats. We shall overcome. Stop singing. But no matter how violent people got, we stayed true to our rules. Be friendly. Be courteous. We shall overcome. I said stop singing. Remember love and nonviolence. It was my first arrest. It wouldn't be my last. When people bombed our lawyer's house, we kept calm, and we marched. It was the first mass march for civil rights that anyone had seen at such a scale. We marched in silence, black and white protesters together. Soon after, Nashville became the first big southern city to give black people the rights we deserved and let everyone sit together. But there was still so much to do. We protested movie theaters that wouldn't sell tickets to black people. One ticket, please. I can't serve you. We held freedom rides, protesting bus companies that wouldn't allow black people on board. Each time, they called us names. Each time, they came at us with violence. Each time, they threw us in jail. But we never lost our calm and we never ever stopped fighting for what was right. The question people ask me more than any other is simply, how do you do it? How do you let someone scream at you, hit you, yet you never raise your hand in self-defense? The answer is I have faith. That doesn't mean it's easy. In fact, it's hard. But having faith means you believe in something so deeply you'll figure out how to make a way out of it. No, uh, how to make a way of no way. Strength like that can't be ignored. People joined us from around the country. Pastors, rabbis, teachers, all types of people. All of them making us stronger than ever. We need to march with them. That's not fair. We need to march. We should have our own freedom rides. We should go there and march. What do you want? Feed em. You could feel it. More change was coming. By 1963, one million Americans held their own protests. Two men named A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin organized a peaceful march on Washington, D.C. At 23 years old, I was the sixth speaker. I was so nervous, my voice trembled at first. And then... To those who have said, be patient and wait, we must say that we cannot be patient. 
We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. After the March on Washington, a new law, the Civil Rights Act, was passed, but it didn't include enough protections for voting rights. Black people were still being stopped from voting. To protest, 600 activists in Selma, Alabama, planned to walk 54 miles to the state capital of Montgomery. The governor said he would stop us. You know they're going to attack us. I know, but people want to march. We can't let them march alone. We walked two by two, many of the people coming straight from the church. When we got to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, a wall of state troopers blocked our way. Can you swim? No. Well, neither can I. But we might have to. This is an unlawful assembly. You have two minutes to turn around. Going forward would have led to violence, so I turned to my friend. We should kneel and pray, Jose. Troopers, advance! I was the first to be hit. They knocked us down. They hit us hard. They sprayed us with a gas that stung our eyes. We remained peaceful, but we didn't make it across. That day was named Bloody Sunday. People around the country saw the violence faced by protesters. It made them realize how poorly black people were treated. That's not right. We need to march with them. Two days later, while I was recuperating, Dr. King came. This time, there were 2,500 people trying to make it across the bridge. We will get to Montgomery. No, you won't. I promise you won't. Like before, we tried. Like before, we stayed peaceful. Like before, we didn't make it across. Did that stop us? Not a chance. Our third try was on March 21st, 1965. Now we had 8,000 people. Together, we marched for five days. My injuries were so bad, they had to drive me home each night. It still didn't stop me. I marched seven miles for the first day. 16 on the 2nd, 11 on the 3rd, 16 on the 4th, then 6 miles on the final day. Check out the crowd! Black, white, Asian, Native American, Christian, Jewish, all standing together. I marched in the rain. I marched with my injuries. I marched the whole world saw, including the White House. Miss President Johnson sent the troops to keep us safe. We shall overcome! Eventually... We reached Montgomery, Alabama. Soon after, a new law, the Voting Rights Act, was passed and the voting rules began to change. But my work? It was just beginning. There's a time to march and there's a time to run. The chain To change the laws, I needed to make the laws. In 1986, I was elected to the U.S. Congress, the second black person to win in Georgia ever. I was arrested five times as a congressperson, too, protesting whenever I thought people were being treated unfairly. My life is proof. Protest can change the world. In my life, I was told to stay out of trouble, to stay quiet, to stay out of the way. That's definitely the easier path. But when you or someone else is being treated unfairly, it's not the right path. If something isn't right or just or unfair... Or you need to say something, do something, help those who need it. Make some noise and move your feet. Freedom only comes when people take action. Remember how his local library denied him a library card? John Lewis finally went back there in 1998 to sign his own book. The librarian celebrated him by finally giving him a library card. One of the great things he did in Congress was to help establish the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Go visit! In 2011, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. During the Civil Rights Movement, a man named Elwin Wilson attacked John Lewis. In 2009, he was so embarrassed of his racism, he asked for forgiveness, the only one to ever do so. Without hesitation, John Lewis accepted his apology. I have faith in my dreams. I have faith in my country. 
I have faith that we can make a way out of no way, and in that I am unshakable. There are only pe we are o we are one people, we are one family, and now it's time for you to do your part. Stand up, speak up, be prepared to march. It's your turn now. I am John Lewis. I am never afraid to get in good trouble. Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. John Lewis Timeline February 21, 1940, born in Pike County, Alabama. 1956, petitions local library at age 16. November 1959, first sit-in at Harvey's department store. February 27, 1960, first time arrested for sit-in in Nashville. May 1961, Freedom Riders leave Washington, D.C. for New Orleans, Louisiana. August 1. August 28, 1963, speaks at the March on Washington. June to August, 1964, Mississippi Freedom Summer. March 7, 1965, leads first march across Pettus Bridge. March 21st to the 25th, 1965, Selma to Montgomery Voting Rights March. December 21st, 1968, marries Lillian Miles. 1986, is elected to the U.S. Congress. 2011, receives the Presidential Medal of Freedom. March 8, 2015, joins President Barack Obama and George W. Bush in Selma to mark the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. 2016, becomes first congressperson to win National Book Award. July 17, 2020, dies at age 80 from pancreatic cancer. The left photo is John Lewis Voting Rights March in Selma, 1965. The top photo on the right is Martin Luther King Jr. in the center, John Lewis on the far right at the Voting Rights March in 1965. And then the bottom right is John Lewis being pulled from the lunch counter during a protest in Nashville of 1960.